Good morning. morning. Welcome to God's house this morning here at Good Shepherd Lutheran Church. Uh, It's great to have you with us today as we get a chance to gather around God's word together as a family of faith. So welcome to all of you here and welcome also to everyone who's joining us online today. Thankful that we have that capability also. So in our service today, it is Reformation Sunday, as you see on the screen. And this, of course, goes back to a historical event over 500 years ago. Uh, when someone who was a monk and a, and a priest, Martin Luther, put some, some talking points on a church door called the 95 Theses that wasn't really meant to start anything, but it was really all about how the church at that time had kind of lost the way of what does God in the Word actually say? And everything that happened since then, it's not about celebrating Martin Luther, it's about celebrating that idea of we need to get back to what the Bible says. You know, what does it actually say in the Word? And that's what we're focusing on today, that Reformation is a time, and really every day is a time, for us to stand firm on what the Bible says. There might be opposition, there might be troubles because of it in this world, but we know that God has a plan beyond this world, uh, and that's why we hold on to that truth of God's Word, and it's why we stand firm in it. So that will be the, the... the theme of our service today on this uh, Reformation Sunday. And we will begin then with our opening hymn. It's called The First Song of Isaiah.
Please stand. We follow the order of service as is printed in your worship folder and on the screens behind me. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. If we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. Let us confess our sins to the Lord. Holy God, gracious Father, I am sinful by nature and have sinned against you in my thoughts, words, and actions. I have not loved you with my whole heart. I have not loved others as I should. I deserve your punishment both now and forever. But Jesus, my Savior, paid for my sins with his innocent suffering and death. Trusting in him, I pray, God have mercy on me, a sinner. Our gracious Father in heaven has been merciful to us. He sent his only son, Jesus Christ, who gave his life as the atoning sacrifice for the sins of the whole world. Therefore, as a called servant of Christ and by his authority, I forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. For the peace from above and for our salvation, let us pray to the Lord. For the peace of the whole world, for the well-being of the Church of God, and for the unity of all, let us pray to the Lord. For this holy house, and for all who and praise let us pray to the Lord help save comfort and defend us gracious Lord
be with you. Let us pray. Gracious Lord, our refuge and strength, pour out your Holy Spirit on your faithful people. Keep them steadfast in your word. Protect and comfort them in all temptations. Defend them against all their enemies. And bestow on the church your saving peace. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. You may be seated. Our God speaks to us in his word this morning, first of all, from the Old Testament book of Daniel, chapter 6. And we'd actually talked last week about how, yeah, God used Daniel to serve in a, in a foreign government, and he, he served it to the best of his abilities. And it did lead to problems, though, as we see here, as the, you know, the most famous story from the book of Daniel, Daniel in the lion's den. The reason he was going to get thrown in the lion's den is because he refused to not stand firm on the truth of what God said in his word. And yes, God protected him and, and brought him out safely. Uh, but the reminder for us isn't necessarily the safety in this world. It's the standing firm on God's word, even when there's opposition against it. Read from Daniel 6. Now when Daniel learned that the decree had been published, and this is a decree that people could only bow down and pray to basically the king, not any other God. When he heard that that decree had been published, he went home to his upstairs room where the windows opened toward Jerusalem. Three times a day, he got down on his knees and prayed, giving thanks to his God, just as he had done before. Then these men went as a group and found Daniel praying and ask, asking God for help. So they went to the king and spoke to him about his royal decree. Did you not publish a decree? that during the next 30 days, anyone who prays to any god or human being except to you, your majesty, would be thrown into the lion's den? The king answered, the decree stands in accordance with the law of the Medes and Persians, which cannot be repealed. So the king gave the order, and they brought Daniel and threw him into the lion's den. The king said to Daniel, may your god, whom you serve continually, rescue you. A stone was brought and placed over the mouth of the den, and the king sealed it with his own signet ring, with the rings of his nobles, so that, the, so that Daniel's situation might not be changed. Then the king returned to his palace and spent the night without eating and without any entertainment being brought to him, and he could not sleep. At the first light of dawn, the king got up and hurried to the lion's den. When he came near the den, he called to Daniel in an anguished voice, Daniel, servant of the living God, has your God, whom you serve continually, been able to rescue you from the lions? Daniel answered, May the king live forever. My God sent his angel, and he shut the mouths of the lions. They have not hurt me, because I was found innocent in his sight. Nor have I ever done any wrong before you, your majesty. The king was overjoyed and gave orders to lift Daniel out of the den. And when Daniel was lifted from the den, no wound was found on him because he had trusted in his God. The word of the Lord. We'll continue then with our psalm of the day. It's a version of Psalm 46, and that's the psalm that uh, A Mighty Fortress was based on. Uh, but we'll sing the version that's uh, found in your worship folder uh, with the help from the choir.
Our God also speaks to, a, speaks to us in his word from the Apostle Paul's letter to the Romans, chapter 3. And when we talk about standing firm on the faith, uh, it's good to remember, what is that faith again that we're standing firm on? And this section of Romans just kind of hits the nail on the head and reminds us that we're standing firm on this fact that we're saved by faith alone, not by what we do, not by our actions, good or bad, but by what Jesus has done, and then God gives us what Jesus has done by faith. So we read from Romans chapter 3. Now we know that whatever the law says, it says to those who are under the law, so that every mouth may be silenced and the whole world held accountable to God. Therefore, no one will be declared righteous in God's sight by the works of the law. Rather, through the law, we become conscious of our sin. But now, apart from the law, the righteousness of God has been made known, to which the law and the prophets testify. This righteousness is given through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe. There is no difference between Jew and Gentile, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, and all are justified freely by his grace through the redemption that came by Christ Jesus. God presented Christ as a sacrifice of atonement through the shedding of his blood to be received by faith. He did this to demonstrate his righteousness, because in his forbearance he had left the sins committed beforehand unpunished. He did it to demonstrate his righteousness at the present time, so as to be just and the one who justifies those who have faith in Jesus. Where then is boasting? It is excluded. Because of what law? The law that requires works? No, because of the law that requires faith. For we maintain that a person is justified by faith apart from the works of the law. The word of the Lord. And please stand for the reading of the gospel. The gospel for today is from the gospel according to Matthew chapter 10, and this will also serve as the basis for the sermon this morning. Jesus said, I am sending you out like sheep among wolves. Therefore, be as shrewd as snakes and as innocent as doves. Be on your guard. You will be handed over to the local councils and be flogged in the synagogues. On my account, you will be brought before governors and kings as witnesses to them and to the Gentiles. But when they arrest you, do not worry about what to say or how to say it. At that time, you will be given what to say, for it will not be you speaking, but the Spirit of your Father speaking through you. Brother will betray brother to death, and a father his child. Children will rebel against their parents and have them put to death. You will be hated by everyone because of me. But the one who stands firm to the end will be saved. When you are persecuted in one place, flee to another. Truly I tell you, you will not finish going through the towns of Israel before the Son of Man comes. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise we'll continue then with our next hymn. You may be seated.
grace, mercy, and peace are yours from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Friends, this is not how things were supposed to look according to the brochure. And, and that phrase uh, is taken from actual brochures, right? And this might be a foreign concept to, to people who are, are younger, maybe. But of course, you didn't used to be able to just look on the internet for everything. And so if you wanted to take a vacation, for example, um, you might go into a place called a travel agent, and they would have a, like a wall of brochures for different places you can go. You know, rather than doing an internet search and looking through online reviews, right, there'd be a brochure where, oh, okay, um, you can look, and of course, in making the brochure, they're gonna wanna make things look as nice as possible, and then you would book the trip with the travel agent, and problems would arise, of course, when someone said, this is not what it looked like on the brochure, and this is not what I was expecting. And an example of that happened to my wife's family when she was a kid. And so basically, you know, she came from a family where there was, she was the youngest of four. Um, her dad was a pastor, and their family, when my wife, who was the youngest, was about six or seven, was going to go to Florida to go to Disney World. A big deal of a trip uh, for this young family to take. And they went to the you know, travel agent. Uh, there was probably a brochure involved. Uh, they, they made their reservations. They got on the plane. And, and when they landed, the, the first hint that something was off um, was when they went to the rental car place. And now, OK, so this is in the 80s. So maybe the car didn't look like this exactly. But first of all, they didn't have their, reserva their reservation uh, listed at all at the rental car place. So OK. Well, do you have anything that will fit two parents and four kids? And, and they did, thankfully. They had a car that would fit. Um, there is just a little minor thing. The air conditioning um, wasn't working in this car. So yes, it's Florida. Yes, it's the middle of summer, so it's a little hot. But you know what? At least you have a car. Um, so they, all right, they got the rental car. Uh, well, at least they can go to their resort, right? Uh, whatever the place was that they were supposed to be staying, I don't know a lot of the details of what it was all supposed to look like. but. When they got to the address, uh, and of course you can't use online maps, you know, so they probably had to, you know, pull a map from the car rental place and, you know, find the address. They get there, though, they're surprised to see kind of a sign, and again, it didn't look exactly like this, but a sign, you know, construction sign, and it was basically to the extent of future site of vacation resort, right? So apparently they get there, and the place they're supposed to stay has not been built yet at this time. And, and seriously, this is a real, like, I'm not making this up just for, hey, can I make up a story about you guys for a sermon? Sure. No, it's, like, it's a real, they get there, and there's no resort. And, and I don't know if someone from the resort was trying to scam someone or, or the, the travel agent office. Apparently, they eventually got money back. You know, it seemed like a lack of due diligence, maybe, on the travel agency part. I don't know. Um, but they didn't get the money back right away, of course. This is going to take a while. So here's this young family there. They've got to go find some other place. Uh, and apparently, and maybe this is still the case, but uh, in Florida at that time, you know, if the family was bigger than four total people, you had to buy two rooms, right? So, okay, now this expense is going to go up. And they did find a place, and they had their vacation. And then, you know, my wife still has good memories from it. But it was definitely a case of this is not what we were planning when we booked this trip, and this has become, and I can just imagine for you know, mom and dad at that time, kind of a nightmare of a trip, at least it started that way. And while we think today, well, hopefully that won't happen you know, if we're doing a trip, at the same time, it can happen for much bigger things than that, and that's you know, our whole lives as Christians. You know, here we are, you know, Reformation Sunday, and we think, oh, it's you know, it's great to hear the trumpets and to hear the choir sing. And, you know, this reminds us of the, you know, some of the basic foundational truths of our faith. You know, we're saved by, by faith alone, by grace alone, you know, through faith alone. And it's all in the scripture alone. You know, wonderful truths. We think this is great. And we think surely everyone else in the world uh, agrees with us here. Okay, we know that's not the case. 
But then sometimes when we go through difficulties in our lives, there's a part of us that thinks, well, you know, Lord, if I know the truth of your word, and I know the important things, that's, you know, it's not about what I do, it's about what you've done. Um, there's a part of us that sort of thinks, aren't things going to go a little better and not be filled with so much problems? And even though there might be part in the back of our minds that knows, well, of course, it doesn't work that way exactly, but still, when we face those troubles and struggles, you know, we struggle with it. You've probably seen a picture like this. You know, I've seen it um, probably online. This whole idea of, of, you know, well, we have our plan for our life, but, you know, how our life actually works is a, is a whole, different, whole different story sometimes, and that's true. And it can be especially hard when we're, believers sometimes because the temptation that we're going to want to have is shouldn't God know I'm, I'm one of the ones who's trying to do it right? I'm trying to like we're talking about today stand firm on God's word right? I'm trying to be steadfast in my faith yet I get faced with all this stuff too and then maybe I look at someone else who in my mind is not continuing steadfast in their faith, and they seem to have it a lot easier, and we think, why, why is this happening? And then when we might face trouble, not just despite the fact that we're believers, but when we face trouble because we're believers, right? Because speaking about our faith or, or standing up and maybe disagreeing with someone somehow uh, because of, well, this is what I believe, and it's not received well, and in fact, we suffer more because of it. And, and the temptation, you know, is kind of like, you know, is this really worth it? Because, you know, I thought things were supposed to work out better. You know, I thought we'd be saying, by faith alone, and everyone would be cheering, and it doesn't work that way. And so that's why it's good, you know, on, on a Reformation Sunday to hear that encouragement again. Stand firm to the end. That's what Jesus tells us. And he doesn't pull punches when it comes to the expectation for our lives. Jesus reminds us that, yes, in this world, you know, you will face troubles uh, in your lives. And not just the same troubles that everyone faces, although, we, yeah, we all have things that, you know, everyone goes through. But sometimes because of our faith. And the temptation is, well, if I just either forget about my faith or just maybe keep it quiet, keep a low profile, keep your head down, uh, then maybe the faith won't be such a, so much of a problem. But we're reminded today, again, stand firm to the end. Stand on the truth of God's word that really means everything to us because it tells us the truth of our God and his son and his rescue of us from our sins. So that's what we're looking at in this section that we read just a few moments ago from Matthew chapter 10. As Jesus is speaking to his disciples, and as I mentioned, Jesus does not pull punches with this as we see our text. You know, I am sending you out like sheep among wolves. Therefore, be as shrewd as snakes and as innocent as doves. You know, he's, he's drawing from the animal kingdom here, uh, but it's pretty clear what he's getting at. You know, sheep among wolves. I don't think you need to be, you know, an expert in the animal kingdom or biology to know that, you know, for sheep and wolves, Wolves are the predator. Sheep are the, you know, the predator's meal, at least in the predator's mind, right? So Jesus said he's sending us out into a world and into a sinful world that is not happy with us and, in fact, would be happy to, again, in the sheep and wolf picture, would be happy to consume us, right? Would be happy to get rid of us. And, again, Jesus is telling this to his disciples and he still tells it to us. And so he's telling us, be ready for that. And that's where, you know, bringing up these other animals. Be as shrewd as snakes and as innocent as doves. Again, he's not telling us to go, you know, go play their game and go turn whatever they do to you, turn it right back against them. And then, no, Jesus, he does say be innocent as doves. He's not wanting us to go, you know, sinfully at, at, at the world that it might not be treating us well. But he wants to be smart about what we're doing. Shrewd as snakes, you know, we might think of that normally in a, in a negative way. But again, to realize walking into a dangerous situation uh, like his disciples were going to be and like we do in our lives, understand that, 
right? Don't, don't be fooled into thinking, yeah, everyone, everyone's okay with this because uh, Jesus tells us, no, that's not how it is. He goes on. Be on your guard. You will be handed over to the local councils and be flogged in the synagogues. On my account, you will be brought before governors and kings as witnesses to them and to the Gentiles. We think, and it's true, Jesus is telling this to his disciples that were gathered there, and that very group would do a lot of these things. You know, where, all right, after Jesus died and rose again, he ascends into heaven, and now his disciples are going to go out and, and spread the news, and it wasn't always met with enthusiasm, right? Even among, you know, as we see here, uh, councils and synagogues, even among uh, God's Old Testament people back then, uh, it wasn't met, you know, with, with enthusiasm, and they would face trouble and, and even violence, and then sometimes, you know, they were brought to, to more and more authorities. We see that in the Bible with someone like uh, the Apostle Paul. Uh, and we actually see it with him on both sides of the persecution. Because, of course, before the Apostle Paul, before we called him the Apostle Paul, he went by the name Saul. And there we see, like in the book of Acts, Saul was one of those persecutors. And he would be one of the ones traveling around to different cities, and if he found someone who was preaching about Jesus, he threw him in jail. And when we hear the story of, of Stephen, who is this, uh, someone who is serving uh, the early church, uh, when he heard about Stephen, Paul, or uh, we know him as Paul, he was known then as Saul, uh, but when Saul was there, he approved of Stephen getting executed and being the first martyr, right? And Stephen had to do Exactly what it says here, where Jesus says, on, on my account, you'll be brought before governors and kings and witnesses to them and to the Gentiles. Stephen had to stand up in front of a crowd, and it's amazing. If you read it there in Acts, he gives this really long speech. He goes through almost the whole Bible. He gives them a summary of, all right, this is what God did. He promised this, and then it ends with, and then he sent Jesus, and he sent Jesus as the Savior, yet so many turned against him, and they crucified him. He went through the whole thing, and upon hearing it, they didn't say, wow, you've convinced us, Stephen. What a great, thank you for telling us this. No, they killed him, right? And, and Saul was there. And then eventually God turned Saul, you know, and made him a believer. And now he was the one going out and preaching the good news. Yet he had to then defend himself. And he was the, on the other side of it. And he did exactly what Jesus said he was going to have to do. He was brought before governors and kings and was a witness. And, of course, there are more stories like that. When we think of Reformation, what we're talking about, yeah, uh, even though we as Lutherans, you know, we're not worshiping Martin Luther. Uh, we know he wasn't a perfect person either. But, again, we see how he had to do those things where he would, uh, again, talk about the, the church of his day and say, you know, you've you kind of lost the, the message of what the word actually says, that, you know, it's, it's not about us doing enough things to, to make God happy with us, and we certainly can't buy, you know, something that would make God happy with us, you know, but instead, how it's, we're saved by, by grace alone, through faith alone, stand on the scripture alone, and, and they gathered him before some high authorities and they said, you know, Martin Luther, we'll make this easy for you. All you have to do is take it all back. All the stuff you've been teaching, you won't be in trouble anymore. Just say, I recant. Uh, and take it all back, and you can go on and about your day, uh, and you're not in trouble anymore, and no harm, no foul. Uh, and of course, he, did, he wasn't willing to do that, right? He said, I will not recant, and he did not take it back, and he, he was in trouble, right? I mean, there was, there was a time where it was, if someone found him, they could kill him legally and, and not get in trouble for it. So it was, it was a mess. And, and, but the point of this, again, wasn't about, really even about Martin Luther, it's about the truth of God's word, that it's worth standing firm on that. And we think, well, okay, but for us, we're not exactly going to get called before, you know, be called before kings uh, you know, are we going to get called to, to testify, but some sort of, you know, Senate subcommittee, you know, airing on C-SPAN or something where they're going to ask us about our faith and tell, you know, we think, well, that doesn't sound particularly likely, does it? 
But the thing is, we, we don't know how we might have to witness to that truth. In fact, one of our main points today is stand firm despite the opposition. Again, now this opposition doesn't have to be necessarily in the form of kings, and it doesn't have to be necessarily in the form of someone who will take our life if we don't give them the answer we want. But boy, it can be in subtler ways, in ways of someone maybe that we were close to not appreciating us, sharing words about our faith, Uh, of someone, uh, maybe they wouldn't come out and say this, but maybe they wouldn't treat us the same way uh, when we share what we believe. And again, the temptation would be, kind of like for Martin Luther when they say, just recant and it's all over. The temptation would be, maybe I don't have to share it. Maybe I can just share it, you know, okay, I can come to church and know that those people are safe, right? But, but anyone outside of that, you know, I can kind of watch my mouth a little bit and maybe not get in trouble. Maybe I can kind of skate by there. But remember, Jesus is telling us to stand firm, right? And that doesn't mean to, to purposely, you know, I think they use the word today, troll. You know, like when you're, when you're fishing, uh, the, the trolling lines are just out there trying to catch anything it can find in the water. And, and people today, you know, just say something to make people mad and to get them riled up is trolling, they'll say. And, and, and Jesus hasn't called us on it just, just, just to throw things out there and, you know, get a rise out of people and try to make them mad. You know, that's not the point. But the point is, you know, what Jesus is telling us is so important, we don't want to lose it. To know that it's not our actions It's not us being good enough for God to accept us. Because really, just about every religion in the world, and even a lot of the Christian church in the world, the whole idea is, well, you just have to be good enough. You have to do enough right things, or maybe you have to make, if you have the good things you do, if they're more than the bad things you do, if you can tip the scales in your favor, then God will be happy with you. And, And you see the problems that leads to in the world where if you think you have to be good enough, there's one of two results, right? Either you think you've actually done it. I am good enough. I have done enough good things, not like some of those other people I know, right? You have this false sense of how good you are and this false sense of pride, and yes, Lord, you should want me to be one of your people because I'm one of the good ones, right? And not realizing that, sorry, one sin is enough to be too many, you know, so either, either you're on that side and, and you think you're good when you're not, or you go on the other side and you realize, I can never do enough. There's no way I can live up to this. And now you're in complete despair because what's the point of trying when, I, when we're just going to fail anyway? What's the point of trying to be good when I was already born imperfect? There's no point of it. So who cares, right? But, but God tells us, no, that's not the case. Jesus paid the price. Like we had in that Romans reading that that we are saved by faith in Jesus, that he has given us that righteousness of God and has given it to us by faith so that we stand before God not as worthy on our own, but as his forgiven children, as people who have been made worthy by the blood of Jesus. You know, what a message that is. And that's not something that we're okay just letting someone else blindly not realize, right? We want them to know this, right? Because we care about people. Jesus sure did. He cared about this world that had turned against him enough to die for them, to give his life for all people, right? And as people who are recipients of that and and beneficiaries of God's love for us, we want other people to know too. So we want to stand firm on that message Jesus has given us despite the opposition, yeah, it, it might not be, you know, with, with a weapon pointed at us. We pray it's not. It might not be before a world leader, you know, somehow uh, to give that message. It might not. That would be, be a neat opportunity if it was. But what, whatever opportunities God places in front of you, Jesus is telling you, stand firm. Be a witness for what I have done. And, of course, that can sound scary, too. It can sound scary because... And I've heard people say this, 
how do I say the right thing? How do I make sure I actually, you know, I, I know what to say and I don't say it wrong? I mean, we talk about where, you know, we're, we want to stand on the truth of God's word, but what if I don't have, you know, what if I don't have everything figured out? What if I misspeak? And now they, they get the wrong impression of God because of me, and we worry about all those things. And I think Jesus anticipated this uh, when he talked to his disciples here in our text as he goes on. He says, but when they arrest you, do not worry about what to say or how to say it. At that time, you will be given what to say, for it will not be you speaking, but the Spirit of your Father speaking through you. Now we can hear this, and you know Jesus was ta- telling this to his disciples, and this is at a time where you know, God did allow his disciples to perform miracles and things like that. So there could have been, especially at this time, Jesus talking to his disciples, there could have been a miraculous element to this where he was saying, I mean, and we did see this at different times, where the disciples could say things like they've never even heard before. Like they could know facts about God that they had never even been taught and just say it. And we might think, well, is God really promising that to us today? And how can, how can the Spirit be speaking through us today? And what do we, and, and this is really a reminder for us, because God hasn't always promised to use miraculous means, you know, and, and say that, you know, it's sort of like someone who's about to take a test in school, and then they pray to God, help me do well on this test. And then, of course, they take the test, they completely fail the test. And, you know, the teacher might ask, well, why did you fail this test? And they might say, well, I mean, I don't know why. I prayed. I asked God to help me do well on the test, and I guess, I guess God's answer was no. Um, and the teacher might say, well, how did the studying go? I mean, did these questions take you by surprise? And you know, student, well, I didn't study at all. I, I prayed, and I asked God to, to bless me on this test, and apparently he said no. And uh, again, you can see, hopefully, the answer there is that praying to God is wonderful, right? And one of the ways that God answers that prayer is to give you the abilities and the means to do the work for that test so that you can do well, right? He's not saying, pray to me and then just go do whatever you want. And so there's a reminder for us here too. When we want to be sharing our faith, the, the idea isn't don't pay attention to your faith or forget everything I tell you, just show up at the moment and, and then pray and hope it goes well. He's reminding you to, when you're standing firm on the truth of God's word, it really implies that you're also staying in God's word, that you're finding yourself where the Holy Spirit is. And he tells us he's in the word. He tells us he's working through that word to build up our faith and build up our trust in him. You know, does that mean we're going to memorize the entire Bible? Probably not, right? But as we continue in that word, God will use what we've learned and what the Holy Spirit gives us from that word. Again, more so in, than just a, a book knowledge that someone might study some other subject, you know, God is at work through this gospel message. And he can build up you know, our faith in that through the simple words from the Bible God uses that for our advantage so that when we are in that position, again, it's not that we're necessarily the most learned Bible scholar, but that God can use the faith he's given us to help us share that good news. Right? Does, again, does that mean we're automatically going to do it perfectly? Probably not. But as we continue in that word and as we take those opportunities to continue to grow in that word when we're not being persecuted— when we're not in front of the judge or the, you know, the, the world leader or whatever the case may be, when we grow in that word, then God is preparing us for the opportunities that might come, the opportunities that might come to share that message. And then we can be reminded, as we have for our, our next point here, stand firm, relying on God's strength. Right? Doing that doesn't mean that it's all up to you now and that whenever a case comes, it's, you know, it's you between that person and, you know, that person's eternal destiny is in your hands alone. Well, no, right? It's still in God's hands. But we can have that confidence of knowing, I know what God has filled me up with. I know what he has given me, the truth of his word, the truth of his grace, his undeserved love for me. 
And what a blessing to be able to share that with others. Right? And knowing that can give us that confidence. It doesn't mean the difficulties go away, right? Because Jesus keeps talking after this, and it, it sort of seems like, oh, wait, he just said they'd have the message, and, and then he mentions a bunch of other troubles going on. And it's true. I mean, in this sinful world, those troubles are there. You know, Jesus continues. A brother will betray brother to death, and a father his child. Children will rebel against their parents and have them put to death. He said this faith will cause division among families. You will be hated by everyone because of me. But the one who stands firm to the end will be saved. Again, Jesus doesn't sugarcoat. He says, yes, this will be difficult, but stand firm to the end. He ends, uh, when you're persecuted in one place, flee to another. Truly, I tell you, you'll not finish going through the towns of Israel before the Son of Man comes. There, there's some uncertainty in what, what Jesus was referring to. Is he saying that you know, as they preach the good message, they're not going to run out of people to preach to before Jesus rises from the dead with his disciples then? It's more like he's talking to all of us and saying, you know, we don't know when Jesus will return, but basically there's plenty of people to tell this message to. We're not going to run out of people that, that we have to talk to and to be a witness to. And we might think, well, I don't even know who that person would be. The thing is, you probably do. Because God will put you in the situations where he needs you. He will put you, again, maybe not before a king, maybe not you know, under penalty of death before you know, some authority, but he might put you in a situation where you get to speak to a family member or a classmate or a friend, and God might use that message he has put in your heart and that he planted, and that he may grow, and that he has been nourishing with his strength, he might put you in that situation where you get to witness to it. And friends, what a blessing that is. Because this Reformation Sunday reminds us not that everything will work great for us in this life, but it reminds us we have everything we need for this life and for eternal life. It's in the Word. We know we've been saved by grace alone. We know we get it through faith alone. We know it's all there in the scripture alone. So what a blessing then to have that message and to be able to, to share it, to be able to be willing to stand firm on that truth and know that that standing firm has an end point because someday God will call us home. Someday uh, we will stand before our Lord and there won't be any more standing firm necessary because God will just take us in his arms and we'll be with him forever in his strength now and for eternity. Amen. And I invite you then to please stand. As we take this chance to confess our faith today, we'll do this using the words, and this is from the, the catechism, but it's Martin Luther's explanation to the second article of the Apostles' Creed, uh, which is talking about Jesus and his work. Uh, so we'll speak these words together. I believe that Jesus Christ, true God, begotten of the Father from eternity, and also true man, born of the Virgin Mary, is my Lord. He has redeemed me, a lost and condemned creature, purchased and won me from all sins, from death, and from the power of the devil, not with gold or silver, but with his holy precious blood, and with his innocent suffering and death. All this he did that I should be his own and live under him in his kingdom and serve him in everlasting righteousness, innocence, and blessedness, just as he has risen from death and lives and rules eternally. This is most certainly true. You may be seated. And we'll continue then with our prayer of the church, uh, the responsive prayer, as it's found in your worship folder and on the screen. Um, we are just going to add uh, another prayer uh, today. We're going to have a, a prayer of, of, for my sister, Joanna Walters. Uh, it's a prayer of thanksgiving. First of all, she, she had a surgery this past week uh, on a broken arm to, to sort of fix some things with that. And thanksgiving that the surgery uh, went well. And a prayer for, for God's healing and, and continued uh, relief uh, from that for her. So that'll be a part of our prayers also. But we'll, we'll continue with the responsive prayer of the church. Almighty and eternal God, when the set time had come, you sent your Son, 
our Lord Jesus Christ, to take our place under the demands of the law and endure the just punishment for our sins. You raised him from death in glorious splendor, and for his sake, you richly and daily forgive sins. When the set time had come, you poured out your spirit on your people and called them to proclaim the gospel to every creature. Equipped and encouraged, they carried the story of salvation to all the world. When the set time had come, you raised up your servant Martin Luther to destroy the idols of the medieval age and to restore the pure teaching of the scriptures. You granted power and success to the proclamation of the gospel, and your holy church grew and prospered throughout the world. When the set time had come, you made our fathers bold to take their stand on the truth of your word. Guided by your spirit, they joined hands and hearts under a shared confession and with a determined resolve to work together in the ministry. You have blessed their sons and daughters and enabled us to preserve and proclaim the saving gospel of your Son. Let this be the time when you renew us again by word and sacrament, when you reform our hearts and minds, and when you restore to us the joy of fellowship and service. Grant to us in this age and in this place the courage of the apostles, the steadfastness of the reformers, and the dedication of the fathers of our church's past. Let this be a time to imitate the kind-hearted souls in our church who served the sick, helped the disabled, cared for the abandoned, and comforted the dying. Provide occasions to serve them and times to pray for them. Keep all your children in your powerful and gracious care. As we have opportunity, let this be a time when we recommit ourselves to the ministry of the gospel of your Son. Let us find joy in our unity, zeal for our work, and if it is your will, success in our labor. And give us faith to take up again the trumpet none can silence or mistake, and grant us courage to proclaim once more for all the world to hear. The feast is ready. Come to the feast. May God be gracious to us and bless us. And may the Savior shine upon us. And And Almighty God, we thank you that you have been with Joanna Walters as she underwent surgery this week. Thank you for blessing doctors and medical workers with great skill to be able to perform these surgeries. Continue to be with Joanna as she recovers. Uh, Bless bless her with patience in the healing process, and and according to your will, um, help her to continue to improve and give her that healing that only you can give. Lord, uh, we also ask you to hear us as we pray in silence. Let this time and all our times be used to give thanks for your grace in Christ and to praise you for calling us into your mission to save. Amen. At this time, we'll continue with our offering. While the offering is being gathered, I invite you to fill out the Connect card that you find on each row, and those viewing us online can fill out the online Connect card also. Thanks.
Please stand for prayer. Blessed Lord, you have given us your holy scriptures for our learning. May we so hear them, read, learn, and take them to heart, that being strengthened and comforted by your holy word, we may cling to the blessed hope of everlasting life. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you with favor and give you peace. Amen. Amen. All right, we will continue then with our closing hymn. You may be seated for this hymn.
Once again, good morning and welcome to Good Shepherd. It's great to be with you here today to praise our God together and receive his gifts to us and his word. Uh, special thanks to um, our organist and all our choir and musicians and uh, trumpeters and uh, the handbells also before the service. Thanks for uh, bringing this service a special extra music uh, to celebrate today. A um, couple other announcements. Uh, also, a great thank you to everyone who helped out with our trunk or treat yesterday. Um, it was a little chilly, but really, I mean, outside of that, it really wasn't bad. There was not, it was not raining and sleeting. You know, it wasn't dumping snow uh, during it. Um, chilly, but a really good day. Um, a lot of people, a lot of helpers um, helping us out where we needed it. Um, really fantastic day. We had um, 1,000 plus guests is the way we, we kind of are coming with a number. It's probably not a perfect number, but uh, thankful for even the cold to get so many people through there and um, be able to be that, uh, show a place in the community for Good Shepherd. Thankful for that. Uh, thanks also to Ryan and Steph Carney for really doing the coordinating for this event and just for all there who were there or helped in any way, including bringing candy and things like that. Uh, thankful for all that help. Um, the youth group still selling Christmas wreaths to support the trip to the Wells International Re Youth Rally in Fort Collins, Colorado this coming summer. And uh, those interested in ordering and or supporting their effort uh, can purchase a, th those, those Christmas wreaths, but I think you have to order and have the money in today, is that right? So again, if you're interested, uh, there, I believe there's still those brochures and they'll look exactly like they should on the brochure. Um, check those out uh, and again, order today if you're interested at all in those. Um, also, orders for Advent poinsettias, are, there's another week for those uh, being taken through November 5th. Uh, they'll decorate uh, through the holidays, and they can be picked up on Christmas Day. Uh, you can see Betty Herman if you're interested in those. Um, we do have Faith Night again this coming week. That's November 1st now. We're crossing into November. Um, meals at 530 and Bible study for all ages uh, from 6 to 7. Uh, there's refreshments, donuts, and beverages in our fellowship hall, gym area. By all means, join us for those. Uh, but above all, um, be sure you greet one another also and greet those who are here today, our, our fellow redeemed, uh, and give thanks for, for that as we give thanks uh, on this Reformation Sunday that God has given us his word and the faith to trust it. So thanks. God's blessings. We'll see you again. Thank you.